we thank you. You who are worthy of it all. We thank you for your, now we need to go down a little bit. <laughs> we thank you for your wonderful presence. We thank you for the privilege of being able to come in before your presence. How you yearn to want to, to want to teach us about yourself, Lord. But there is, it's not easy. There's a certain fear because of who you are. So help us tonight, Lord. Help us to overcome the obstacles in our heart and in our mind, in our understanding, that we might know you better, how to work with you, Lord, but mostly how to walk with you. Sometimes you feel so far away, and yet we do know that you tore the veil and you tore it in half. that we would never have to feel so far from you again. But Christ in us, the hope of glory, Christ who will teach us how to rule and reign with him, Christ who will reveal the magnanimity of your love if we can just calm our fears and draw close. Yeshua, how wonderful it was that you came to us and you poured yourself out of all of your own rights to come here to relate to us to help us see the Father you gave it all Yeshua you gave it all You withheld nothing that you might redeem yourself a family and a kingdom that rightfully belongs to our Father. You held nothing back. So great is your love. Tonight, in all that we let our thoughts focus on, let it be your love, the greatness of your love, 
the kindness, the mercy, the long-suffering of your love, that love that keeps reaching out to draw us close. Help us to see, help us to hear, help us to sense what you are saying to our own individual hearts tonight, Yeshua. Great and wonderful is our Father. In your precious name, amen. You know, whoops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm feeling the heart of our Lord right now. And this is what I'm feeling. His heart is so tender. He's here in a very, very tender way. There's something so deep in his heart that he wants you to experience. He wants you to understand about him. He wants you to draw near and let yourself be open to a new insight into who he is and what he's trying to do in your life. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And when the thing that you're dealing with is a lack of understanding of the one who loves you the most and understanding that you can't possibly have until he grants it. You have to seek it, he has to grant it. It doesn't make things easy, does it? It, because you can seek and seek and seek, search and search and search and he can be trying to get, get that understanding to you and you can be trying to get it from him and this happens and this happens a lot, doesn't it? Because we don't know how to recognize it even as it's being sent to us. So he has to change the way we think, not uh, not the way that people think because the elite are trying to reprogram us. I don't mean that. Does that, does that ring a bell? But he has to, he has to change the wiring in our mind, the wiring in our heart to enable us to come outside of any paradigm we've ever known. To touch what he's trying to show us. 
Here we have Jesus. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee. He's talking to his disciples. And how does he try to communicate? He communicates through their, their businesses. He communicates through um, the things that he sees around the Jewish communities day in and day out. So he's trying to explain the kingdom of heaven in the terms that the people can understand and relate to going about their lives and going about their businesses. But in so doing, he has to sacrifice 90% of the message. That's why we need the spirit of revelation is to bring us back up to regain some of what we lost in the way that he had to, to communicate the most high and holy message. So when you're sitting before someone like the disciples were who knows anything you could ever, 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 ever want to know about heaven and about the Father and what he has to give you so you can understand even a little bit is such a small percentage of the whole picture. Jesus didn't get frustrated. He understood. The father doesn't get frustrated because he understands. But I understand why the disciples said to him, just show us the father and we'll believe. And yet he had been, they had been with him 24 seven for probably close to three years at that time. And they're still saying, so tell us about the Father. <laughs> and he's been doing it over and over and over and over again. But using such low information, it would be like, maybe this would be kind of an example. It would be like you're a high schooler and but you're amidst a bunch of first graders. But all these first graders are highly intellectual kids. Emotionally, they're first graders. Mentally, they're capable of receiving so much more. You understand what I'm saying? And so here you are, this high schooler, trying to figure out, do I talk to the emotional or do I talk to the mental? Do I talk to these kids by their tinker toys or do I talk to them like I would a college student? What do I do? How do I help them understand what they're capable of understanding, but they don't have the emotional ability to cope with it. What do I do? How do I do? And that was the, the Father's job, was to bring down the high and holy to a very low place so we could get just a taste of it. Those who are hungry, are you, are you hearing me? Those who are hungry start wanting second grade information, third grade information, fifth grade information. Before you know it, they're crying out for junior high information 
and then up into high school information about the kingdom. From there, they want to they want to swing right through the college years, and all of this stuff has to come not only through revelation knowledge. That's why he gives it to us. It's all packed into this little book, right? My little. <laughs> It's all packed into this little book. But then, you have to unpack it. We all have to unpack it. And if we're in a time in history where we don't have a lot of Christians unpacking it, but God is starting to raise up leaders that he's taught how to unpack it, then it's kind of a fun time in history because now we're learning new things in new ways. Some things so new that they almost seem initially irrelevant. But if you really think things through, none of it is relevant. Right. Well, what, a, what does knowing, knowing intellectually everything you could know about the solar system have to do with how many blades of sand are by and in the ocean? Must have something to do with one another. You know why? Because they're compared to each other. We may never know this side of heaven what that was. But since our Father knows every grain of sand and every star in the heavens, there must be something that had to be equalized to make it all work. Have you ever thought about that? Likewise, our Father knows what he's doing when he's trying to grow us up fast. And in this day and age, we must be willing to grow up fast. That means willing to here express the inexpressible to see the unknown I can remember one time I was ministering in a church past, pastor and his wife and the whole congregation were African American people I just loved them and they liked me and I thought that was a great combination so I get up to minister. I had already ministered several services. I get up to minister this one night and this cloud of knowing suddenly appears over my head. And I'm on my knees because of the holiness of what's on the other side of this cloud. And I tried to explain to them what was happening, that the cloud of knowing, which is like the limits of the known. If you want to go up through that cloud to gain the unknown, it has to happen through permission. So I told the people, I don't know how high he'll let us go. All I know is right now we have over our heads the cloud of the known. That means on this side, everything is already known. We 
Would you like to try to go above? And everyone, you know, yes, yes, yes. So the worship team of this church was phenomenal. So I asked them, I said, how high do you think you can lead us, not in praise, but in worship, until we get lost from ourselves and like sucked into this cloud? Do you think you can do that? Do you think you can get us above the cloud in worship? Because my thing was, if they didn't feel that way, then I would try to talk them through it. No, they felt like they could. So we went back into worship and the Holy Spirit was with them. And all the time that I was there, although they were fantastic, I mean, they were just, they really were so sensitive to the Spirit. They were just incredible. I'd like to take them with me every place I go and say, see what, what you can have in worship if you just worship. They were really good. And there's not a lot of super, super good worship teams in the body of Christ. Not yet, anyway. But in spite of it, the Holy Spirit took control. And he lifted us up through that cloud into the unknown. I can't even tell you what I spoke on that night. I was so drunk, excuse the language, in the spirit. I was so lost in the spirit. They had to carry me back to my hotel. I can't remember anything that was discussed on the way back to the hotel, but they had to literally carry me into my room because my knees were so weak I couldn't walk. I was utterly lost. But yet, I spoke something to them. I taught that night. And the pastor and his wife told me, and they weren't giving glory to me, they knew we were visited, or at least that the Father had taken us into a place of knowing him better that few reach on this earth. And they said it was the most fantastic service they'd ever been in in their whole years of being a Christian. Not just because of the words, but because of the presence that we were allowed to ascend to. Are you with me? Are you interested enough to hear any more? <laughs> Thank you. I had another time like that too. We were in NOLA at that time. We were in the worship service. And when I had a voice that I could do that with, toward the end of the worship service, they would invite me up to lead a song. And so that's what was happening. I, I was leading the song. And maybe the Lord was trying to rescue the congregation from that. I don't know. All I know. <laughs> Lynn's here. She would have been in that service. Um, all I know is that the Spirit of God kept dropping into my spirit little droplets that looked like, um, you know, um, Hershey's kisses. That's what they were shaped like. Um, 
these little droplets into my spirit and every little tiny droplet when it would enter into my spirit would immediately become like an ocean and it would pull me into the ocean of truth do you remember that it would pull me into the ocean of truth and when I was so deep in the ocean I was beyond the ability to make my own current so I had to be rescued he would pull me out a few minutes later another droplet the same thing being pulled into this ocean over and over ocean of truth created by the little droplets over and over and over again it took me three days to recuperate from that from that night three days I was pulled to probably the most wonderful place the human body, uh, human, the human mind could possibly imagine. It was so beautiful. It was so full. It was so filling. It was so rich. It was so divine. It was so pure. So filled with light. So filled with love. It finally got to the place I could no longer talk and they had to get me a chair to sit down to remember that. And they had to stand all around me because I couldn't even sit down in that chair without. I mean, I was worthless. And all I could say to them over and over and over again is, and I would say it like this because I was so out of it. I'd say, truth is, God is love. That's all I could say over and over until I could no longer even say that. Here I am in this vast ocean of truth. Not man's idea of truth, but God, God's truth. I was under the water, the waves would suck me in deeper and deeper, further and further into the ocean of truth. And being encompassed by all of that, all I could say is, truth is, God is love. You would think that he would, you know, like give you a temporary mind of Einstein. Truth is, the equations are as follows. But nothing like that. Just God is love. What does God is love feel like? Would you like to know? I don't know if I can tell you, but if I, if I can, I will. As I was being pulled into this ocean of truth, I felt such a cleansing. You don't even know how much corruption is in you and how much you are constantly being slammed with it in your face, in your spirit, 
against your soul. I'm talking about the spirit of the world. I'm not talking about commercials. I'm not talking about, you know, big signs along the freeway. I'm not talking about internet or television or however you listen to your music. I'm talking about the spirit of the world. You might think one minute, you just love to love everybody. It feels so good and the next minute your heart feels so hard you can't believe it. Spirit of the world. So I'm in this ocean and I'm feeling the process of being cleansed, the cleansing that truth does, cleansing, cleansing, cleaning, cleaning, making pure what was tainted on the inside. It felt like healing waters like 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 a balm not like necessarily waters but like a balm healing balm flowing inside all around every few minutes inside of me i was never i was never still because I was constantly in movement with the current that I was pulled into. It was so beautiful, it was so gentle but powerful. It was so it was so divine yet understandable. When he began to give me visions, he gave me visions of the relationship between the Father and the Son. And they were beautiful and profound visions. You couldn't help but see those and think, I want that. I want that. That's what he came to give us. He came to give us the same relationship with the Father that he has. I want that. It was so pure. It was so filled with light and love. And I don't know if I want to say knowledge, but I don't know that I don't want to say it. Sometimes it's just so hard to put words to things that you see in the spirit. It was like every every movement of the water was like a heartbeat in tune with God. There was like a new knowing of him rising within me. A new knowing, a new kind, a new kind of knowing. How can I explain this stuff? Um, Most of what Christians experience in this life is knowledge about God, knowledge about Jesus. Would you, would you agree with that? 
our messages that come from the pulpit, even when we read the, the Bible, if he doesn't change that inside of us, it's all about God. Point A, point B, point C. But what he has this insatiable desire for, and I felt it caressing every cell in my being, was those that would pay the price to come in deep enough to begin to know experientially God our Father. Not about him, but know him. When you meet someone, when you meet someone, you might think, now, that person would be a good mate for life. I like this about that person. I like that about that person. I think this is great about that person. Did you ever go through that? So you get married, and about a year later, you say to yourself, Looks like I didn't know that person at all. What went wrong? I knew, I thought everything I could know about him or her. Turns out they were so different. So then you have to fall in love all over again, right? It's the same way with God. We stand back and we, we, um, we investigate mentally about God. We may read this sermon or, or that sermon or hear this sermon or that sermon or read various books, trying to find out about God, only to find out years later that that's not really where you wanted to go. Because although finding out about him in all these areas, really what you want is to know him. Just know him. Be intimate with him. Let him be intimate with you. That's really what we're after. Am I wrong? Now people who are really busy seeking, at some point in time they're going to learn that and they're going to learn the difference in the path of the true seeker of God and the path of the true seeker of knowledge. Knowledge about God. So there I am, I'm receiving one Dollop after another, tiny little Hersey's kiss of truth, not knowledge, truth of God. And with every, with every drop, the love that I was experiencing was so much greater than the last. I thought I was going to explode again and again and again because every time that little dollop 
would become an ocean. It felt like I was being stretched to my nth with the love of God, with the truth of God. Have you ever tried to figure out and understand the transcendence of God? You'll never get that one without the spirit of revelation. It's not possible. And there are many such points about which he is willing to reveal to us if we will come and sit before him and pay the price to wait on him to know. And guess what? He wants to give you that information, that truth, more than you could ever want to have it. So why hasn't it happened? Because you're not giving him time. You're not meeting the requirements that necessarily have to be met. to get to know the awesomeness of God. And I, and I mean no experientially. Daryl and I were talking about the Greek words for knowledge. And only one of the, I think, four main Greek words that are used in the Bible about, uh, to depict knowledge, only one really adequately describes what I'm talking about. And that's the word oida. That takes you into unending resources, emotional, mental, physical resources of impartation of truth. One word out of all of them. But all those other three words kind of build the stair step to the biggie. So when he takes me through these experiences, it's so he can impart to me oida, experiential understanding, experiential knowledge, experiential wisdom. I'm feeling it like he feels it. I'm seeing it the way he sees it, not man. Now, what is he going to have to do to the inside of us to enable us to bear that? Have you ever thought about it? Why doesn't God talk to me like that? Well, has he turned you upside down, inside out, thrown away half of what you didn't need? To enable you to have it? Well, no, but then neither do my university professors. He's not a university professor. He's God. And spirit must teach us via spirit, which teaches us via soul, until the two of them can become one in the revelation. This is what he wants me to give you tonight. Is this okay? You can say God is great. He's majestic. There isn't anything he can't do. He can move mountains. He can move rivers. He can move oceans. He can dry up an ocean in a split second of time. He can level a mountain as fast. He can turn night into day, day into night. He can prohibit night if he wants to make the day extra long. We're talking about a very, very powerful being. But is it enough just to have the power? It's okay, just go, hmm. 
is not enough. What you must have to go with that is understanding, knowledge, wisdom. Authority. You can have the power, but if you don't have the authority, it's not going to do you a lot of good. So he has the authority, but he also has the knowledge, the wisdom, and the understanding of how to use what he has. Now think about this for a minute. What does the book of John tell us? that he had to give us the power and authority to become the children of God. Have you ever read that and thought to yourself, huh, why would we need power and authority to become the children of God? Why can't he just say it with a word and it's there? Because to become the children of God, you have to have power and authority that is above your enemy. And there's only one. And that's the Lord's power and his authority. When you become born again, you're immediately thrust in to this new place safe place of living. You're not in the old place anymore. Sure looks the same to me. Well, we have, now they're saying 32 dimensions. So which dimension are you talking about? Do you understand what I'm saying? We can't look at things the way we do with our temporal brain. And since we don't know how to see 32, 32 of them, we don't know how to see two of them, two of the 32 dimensions. We have to take it by faith, right? So we're put into this new place. We're still here on planet Earth, but we are now not in Lucifer's kingdom, which is the, the whole dynamic of the temporal world, but you're picked up, unbeknownst to you, and put into God's dimension on this Earth. And you have to learn to walk there. You don't know that you're learning this. But that's what you have to learn. And to walk there, you have to be filled with power and authority above your enemy. Because this planet is in war. Are you guys with me? Are you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, I'm glad you do. I'm not sure I do. No. <laughs> Just funning with you. So, he, the first thing he wants us to know, and that's why it's right there in the first chapter of John, is you have to have it to become the child of God. You have to have this power, you have to have this authority, and we didn't even know to ask for it. How many of you, when you got saved, said, Oh, Lord, I want Jesus to be my Lord. Please fill me with his power. Please fill me with his authority so I can be ousted out of... <laughs> this terrible kingdom into his... Of course we didn't notice, pray that, but God knew what he had to do to answer our prayers. As Satan is the Lord of the temple plane, God, Jesus Christ, is the Lord 
of God's kingdom. He's a God over all of it, but he is the Lord over God's kingdom. And he's going to take his children and he's going to train them. He's going to teach them. He's going to teach them how to be more than conquerors in every situation. If that's what they want. He's going to empower them to rule over the dynasties that are in the earth that are in the kingdom's, kingdom's ways. How do you like that? I was in Singapore one time and the pastor said to me, they're talking about moving and he told me what the this, what this statue was. This statue that belongs to this God I don't remember now her name. But the but the um the battle is tremendous. The peop the power people say no statue is being moved. It's staying right where it is. Because that is Singapore's one of Singapore's gods. We're not moving the statues. I said, "Okay." He said, "Well, what can you do about it?" I said, well, let's just get through the time together and see what God will do about it. So he took me through teachings to give to the people. And he said, when you've given these teachings, we're going to come against that force that does not want that spirit, that uh, statue moved, and we will move the statue. So that's exactly what we did before I left the island, that statue was moved. We have power and authority over the temporal world, if we believe it. If we understand it, and we understand how God wants us to move in this kind of power and authority. Of course, you have to be very humble because if you get lifted up in pride, it will be moving you. It's true. So you have to be very humble. You have to be very teachable because what they know in the spirit world is so far beyond what you know and understand. So to mess with them and literally destroy pockets of their authority, you have to know how to deal with them. And since you don't live in that plane, you have to be taught. So you have to be teachable. Sometimes he may take you into places where you just really have to move things by love, just pure, divine love. Whatever the case may be, God will teach you how to use the power and authority he's given you to overcome the obstacles of his kingdom that are fighting his kingdom in this temporal world. Doesn't that sound exciting? Yes. Doesn't that sound quizzical? Does it sound like you're tired and you want to go home and go to bed? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> okay, turn to Exodus. Exodus 20. Let's look at 19, Exodus 19, verse 23 first. And Moses said to the Lord, 
the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai because God had spoken to Moses saying, don't let the people come on the mountain. So Moses wanted to correct God, correct his understanding. Don't you remember they can't come up on the mountain? Uh, God, because you said they, you already said they couldn't. <laughs> and Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself charged us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and sanctify it, set it apart for God. Then the Lord said to him, go, get down. You shall come up, you and Aaron, with you, but let not the priests, so God is reiterating this, but let not the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break forth against them. So now Moses has a double warning. Then we read some of the most remarkable words a human being has ever heard. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who has brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before or besides me. You shall not make yourself any graven image to worship it, or any likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visit, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing mercy Mercy, mercy, and steadfast love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not use or repeat the name of the Lord your God In vanity, that is, lightly or frivolously, in false affirmation, or profanely. For the Lord, your Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Earnestly remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, withdrawn from common employment, and dedicated to God. You know, I want to say something here. If my people would have, have not obeyed every commandment, if they, if they just would have obeyed this commandment that I just read, on that, on that Sabbath day, he would have taken the time to reveal himself to the people. Every week, a little more than the week before. And little by little, they would have seen not only the necessity, but they would have had the desire to obey these commandments. But because they messed up on this one. It threw the whole thing off. There was never time to just sit and wait upon God. How many times do we see in this Pentateuch here the people going out, gathering up their food, double, 
or going out on the Sabbath day to gather up their food, disobeying the commandment of God. And God wasn't saying to them, just sit around your tent and be bored. What he wanted them to do was to sit and meditate on all that he had done for them. And to see that this God has the power and the ability to take care of our every need. He's not an idol with no feelings. He's not an idol with no hearing, no seeing. He's a living being. This is what he wanted to communicate to them on this day that they were forbidden to do anything except worship God. Doesn't that tell us as Christians that we have to have this time alone with God. Not necessarily only church, but the time alone with him, where we are learning his ways, we're seeking his truth, we're desiring to hear his voice, to know his heart, and spending this off day just with him coming to experience the peace, just the peace of God. Not to mention the many wonders he would have and could have revealed to them on this day. I remember growing up you know, I'm 74 years old this year. So I remember growing up that in Michigan, where I was initially raised, no, none of the stores could be open on Sunday. Not any of the stores. I don't remember if you could even get gas on Sunday because I was too young to drive. But you couldn't go any place. If you did, you'd get there and no one else would be there. So you might as well just stay home. And I didn't like that. I liked to be able to get out, move around. I thought it was lots of fun to be able to do that. But that's because I didn't understand what that day was all about. My family certainly didn't say, no, this is the Lord's day and we're going to stay home. We're going to learn about God today. That was their problem. They didn't know how to use this day to their greatest advantage. So they didn't. And so they continued to think their own temporal thoughts about what they should do on this day. So keep that in mind. After you go home from church, don't go home from God. Go home from church and as a family, spend the rest of the day with God. Learn about him. Meditate on him. Learn him. Not just about Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your domestic animals. My goodness, the sojourner within your gates, everyone's stuck in the mud for a whole day. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, set it apart for his personal use, which means what? His personal use of revealing himself to you. He 
He's sanctifying everything. He's setting it apart, someone said, because he's holy. Yes. And are these unholy people ever going to learn about the holy God if they don't set themselves aside unto him at least one day a week? No. Regard, treat, and honor due obedience and courtesy your father and mother that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God gives you. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not witness falsely against your neighbor. You shall not cover covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or his maidservant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now all the people perceive the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the smoking mountain. As they looked, they trembled with fear and fell back and stood afar off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us. We will listen, but let us not, let not God speak to us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you so that the reverential fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. So, do you want to know God? Right here is the key. Walk in the fear of God. Only he can get, give us that. Only he can teach us what it means to walk in the fear of God. Only he can give us the, great, the grace to endure walking in the fear of God. But in the fear of God is all knowledge, all wisdom, all understanding, all we need. The revelation of God, the revelation of the kingdom, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It starts with the fear of God. You couple the fear of God with your Sabbath rest and you've got something remarkable going on. What Moses experienced out there in the tent could have been an experience from time to time with different people in the camp. He certainly was close enough to them to do that. He wanted to reveal his beautiful self. But they were, they were too, they were just too human. They were too temporal minded. They were too, what is the word I want? They were too, um, the opposite of spiritual, carnal. They were too carnal. And they didn't know that they had to come out of this carnality to, to enter the realm of the spirit where they could know God. My dear brothers and sisters, our God loves us. When Adam fell, we opened up the serious, serious kingdom of carnality. But in his great love, he knew ahead of time this was going to happen, so he prepared for it. And he prepared thousands of years worth of lessons for us to learn who he is. Why do we still read the Old Covenant? I love the Old Covenant because it really helps you understand God. And not, not just the severity of God, but the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the knowledge, the wisdom of God. It really helps you understand him. 3D.
And what I found is what the psalmist found. Taste. And see that he is good. When you've really tasted him, you really don't want anything else. You go to work, it's like, if you don't go with me, I'm not going in, because it's terrible in that place without you. Isn't that what Moses said? He knew what the world without God meant. God wants students. He wants disciples of us all. And if we are receiving of his discipleship, everything becomes a lesson about God. Did you know that? Today you ran out of gas. So what's that lesson about God? Ask him. Was there a lesson in that? He'll tell you, yes. Because he is in all things concerning us. And he has reasons for teaching us what otherwise would seem like silly, ridiculous lessons. But in the overall picture of God, they can be major pieces of the puzzle. Everything you do every day offers you a piece of the puzzle by night's end to complete the whole picture. Something goes right, something goes wrong. It's just a piece of the puzzle. Who is God in that? What is God in that? What is he trying to say to us? I can remember one time, many, many years ago, this just came to me, so I'll, I'll, I'll just say it. I and a friend of mine were going up to Yosemite in California. We didn't live too far from that. And um, we went up there just to have a nice, quiet time with the Lord, we thought. We got up to, um, just before you enter into the actual park, and our, our, um, our rear, what is it called? Our rear axle broke in our car. Now, for those of you know, that know a little bit about rear axles breaking, you know you really don't want that to happen in a mountain range where there are these kinds of roads. When the police found us, he said, what happened here? We said, we, we really don't know. All we know is we can't move. And he looked around, then he came back, and he said, looks like you've got a broken rear axle here. Looks like someone likes you. And I said, why? And he said, because the way this thing broke, you should have gone over that cliff. This is not the place to have things like that happen. Before we left for this trip, the Lord said, wait a minute, I want to give you a scripture for today. So I looked up the scripture, and the scripture said, I will be with you in the wilderness. And many other such things in that passage of scripture. So when this happened, and we realized we're really in trouble here. <laughs> I, I don't think going, you know, even if they tow us down into Yosemite, is probably the smartest thing to do. So we're probably going to have to just go back to Fresno. I thought about that scripture. He knew what was going to happen, and he wanted us to know he'll take care of us. And he did. I could go through miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle that happened. I mean, it was profound, including 
I ran into this young lady one time and she was crying. It was in church actually. She was crying and I said to her, um, can I help you with anything? Are you okay? Is everything okay? She said, I, I want God but I don't know how to get him. So I led her to the Lord. And then after we were finished, I turned around again before I left where I was, and she'd gone. So that was the last I heard of her. But on this trip, we had to get a hold of a, a wrecker to come pick us up. And I remembered that a friend of ours had an uncle who owns that kind of business. And can you guys hear me okay? And um, so I called information to get his phone number and I'm talking to the, um, the uh, uh, operator and we're just kind of chitty chatting, you know? And I, so I, I told her, we're up here in Yosemite, we need a, a record, so this is the man's name, can you help me with the number? And she said, oh, and she said her name. I'm so-and-so. Well, operators don't do that, do they? I didn't think so. I said, what is your name again? And she shared it a second time. And I said, have you ever met Nita Johnson? She said, yes, Nita Johnson led me to the Lord. I said, I can't believe this. You're talking to her right now. She said, this is amazing. I said, I have wanted to hear about you since that day. So you stayed with the Lord. She said, not only did I stay with the Lord, but I am in Bible school. I said, this is tremendous. So that was a wonderful gift from the Lord. Then... The man who came to get us and tow us back to Fresno has been having dreams about getting saved. <laughs> and so unknowing, not knowing this, I started talking to him about the Lord. And he said, you know him? <laughs> I've been having dreams about getting saved. Can you help me? No, no. So we led him to the Lord and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He gets us back down the mountain and to a place where we're, we're going to have to leave the car for repair. And I said to him, so what is the bill? Oh, I could never charge someone who's just led me to the Lord. <laughs> I said, you're kidding. I mean, this has got to be an incredible bill. He said, it is my gift. I feel like I've been given eternal life. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. He paid for the bill. Then I called my sister. I explained to her all that has happened. And she said, oh, neat. I feel so, so bad for you. And I said, don't feel bad because, I mean, it's just one miracle after another. Better than Yosemite, you know? And... Um, so we'll call you when we get everything resolved. So I called her back, I don't know, maybe an hour later. And I said, so this is what we did. We're back at the house now, so, um, but we won't have a car for a couple of days. And she said, well, I am going to be coming over tonight because Dougie wants to pay for the bill to get your car fixed. And I said, you and Doug, you don't have to do that. God will, God will help us out here, I know. She said, because we're going to do it. <laughs> Can you believe this? Was God with us in the wilderness? I don't tell this story very often, but it sure is a great story. Then there was, I can't remember what the last miracle was, but it was just as fantabulous as everything else. 
God wants us to know we can trust him. He also wants us to know we can know him. And he'll take care of us. Now we're about to go through a storm here in America. The Lord talked to me about it just a few days ago and told me it's close now so you need to start telling the people to prepare. So we're going to be going through this storm. You all pretty much know what it's about and I'm sure you've heard the worst and you've heard the best, right? Yes, yes, say yes. I hope you haven't just heard the worst. <laughs> but it's somewhere in the middle between the worst that they say it will be and the best that they say it will be. And he wants to take care of you. He wants you to know there is nothing to fear. Why? Because you fear God. If you fear God, there is nothing that can hurt you. If you fear God, there's no fear of man. If you fear God, there's no fear of circumstances. Think about my trip up to Yosemite. Was there anything he didn't take care of? No. I would have never dreamed he would be so complete. And, you know, so many different people involved in taking care of the needs. It was just fantastic. God is your friend. What he wants to do first, before the storm kicks off, is prove you by bringing you close to his holiness and allowing you to feel the power that is embodied in his holiness. Now how he might do that from one person to the next, I don't know. We're all different. We all relate to things differently. But start asking God, to know the fear of God. And he will do that for you. Why? Because he loves you. He wants to make you holy and separated unto himself. The, the world out there, the temporal world out there is going to be troubled. But you don't need to be. If you can put some food aside for this time, it would probably be wise. If you cannot do it, believe in God. He'll take care of you. If you've got family members that need to be born again, double up your prayers for them because this is the kind of thing that opens people's hearts for the Lord. And as you're traveling through these times and you're so at rest, you're so at peace, your family members are going to see what a difference there is between what you're experiencing and what they're experiencing at the same time over the same issues. And they probably are going to end up saying, how can you be at such peace at a time like this? So that you can lead them to the Lord, right? Make no other gods before me. Now listen to me, my dear friends. I believe you're here tonight not because of your great love for me,
but because of your great love for our Lord. And if you have a God that you have in front of you, between you and him, you'd want to know if there's anything that is keeping you from being able to um, trust him, to know him, you'd want to know. So this is the time. Don't wait until the storm. This storm is political. It is not judgment from God. We crossed over that line a long time ago through the gatherings. What is left is political. The communist, the new world order, the cabal, all the same, want to rule this, this um, country. And they think that it's, if our, our um, government is filled with their people, this is going to be an easy turnover. But it's not. God will win. He's going to do it his way for our best. This is not God saying, I hate you, America, and this is what I'm going to do to show you how disdained I am with your ungodliness. That is not what this is about. Does he love sin? No, he hates it. But you know what? He loves people. And he wants to help these people who so desperately needs it to step away from the things that distract them from a life in Christ. He wants to help them see that everything is weak and shaking sand and they can trust in nothing except him. This is an invitation. I know a lot of ministers and I'm sorry to say this, but it's just because they don't understand this part of God, that's all. Are telling the church that this is God's big D. You know what that means? Big divorce. God's going to divorce America because he's sick and tired of, of America's sins. That's what they're telling people. It is the big I, do you know what that is? Invitation. Get saved. Come to me. Come into my kingdom. Let me show you the joy of living. Let me show you what it's like to live a pure, clean, holy life. You don't have to be bound by these things. You can walk in freedom in my kingdom. He also wants to correct the way the cabal is constantly using your money to do evil all over the world. Your money, not theirs. Your money. And he wants to turn that around. It'd be nice to get a little bit more money from your paycheck, right? At the very least, to know that the money that they're taking out of your paycheck, they can't spend on sin. Amen. He wants to get that taken care of. And you can go through quite a long list of other things that he wants to deal with. And none of it says the wrath of God. It all says, I'm going to make my sick son better. Amen. 
So everything that he's asked me to talk to you about tonight really brings us down to this point. He is trustworthy. He is trustworthy. You can trust him. He loves you. His power is greater than any. His authority is higher than any. Everything he does, he does out of love. even when he has to discipline in the most severe disciplines. Somewhere in it all is his divine love tempering everything. This is the hour to come to know him and know how worthy he is of your trust and your worship. Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you. Thank you, Father. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we have no reason to fear. Don't fear is your word for us tonight. For you are on the throne. But more than that you are on the throne, you are father to, the, to these children of yours. And even as the son said, can we ask for something of value, something that is good, and you're going to give us evil? No. Because you're a good father. You're going to give us what is good, what is needful. And we're going to come through this brief storm. We'll come out the other side and look back and be so thankful that you loved us enough to do what you're about to do. Surgery is not fun, Father, we know. But we have a cancer in this country that needs to be surgically removed. And that's a big part of what's coming, is removing the cancer. So, Father, I lay these people before you. I ask you to fill them with your joy, your peace. Ask them, I ask you to ask them, Father, to come into your secret place and learn to love your word because your word is truth. And truth promises not bondage, but freedom. Father, I, I know such a microscopic part of you. But it would be so wonderful to get what little I know to these people. And that you would show them through your son, through the spirit, through your word, how to love you, how to be loved by you, how to walk with you, how to receive from you and how to give great pleasure to you. But I'm not capable of doing what is needed. Only your spirit is. And I ask you to do it. I ask that this week 
You will help every person in here spend more time than usual in your word and in prayer, just worshiping you, just falling in love with you all over again. Strengthen them and prepare them for what the cabal has in store. You're such a good God. You're a mighty God. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. Do that in us, Father. Cut out all that needs to be removed and fill us with the life of the Son. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand and let's um, let Eli lead us in this song. if you'd like to just come up here to the altar and kneel before the Lord open your heart to him a little further Lord, wash us with your rain. Sprinkle the drops of your glory upon us tonight. Cause our hearts to swell with love for you. We know you're a faithful God. We know. Help us tuck ourselves into that hiding place with you that we may know it experientially. You're so beautiful, Yeshua. Father Yahweh, so beautiful. We long to know your beauty. We long to see your beauty.
Lord, lead us by the streams, the peaceful streams of cleansing waters, that we might please you and be a glory to you in the earth. Help us to know the beauty of your ways. Feed us in the green pastures that you have prepared just for us. That our words may be pleasing in your sight. is working I'd like everyone to stand with me please and begin to um, is it good okay when I say start please I'd like you to begin to pray in your prayer language um, we have a like a scuttle going on in Texas and Texas standing strong for conservative rights is imperative. Probably more imperative in America right now than it's ever been. And there is a very strong possibility that that can be changed. So um, Daryl is feeling that we could come against that spirit tonight and get some victory for Texas, for the nation. So I'd like you to, um, do you have something you want to say before they start praying? Um, I've been to Texas a few times in the past couple years. And uh, every time I go there, I just sense a very, a very strong, wicked, spirit principality full of malice over the state of Texas so uh, yeah I don't I don't know exactly how to go about it so um. no you're supposed to come up here and act like you know everything yeah. about it <laughs> yeah okay everyone start praying in tongues and if he if he doesn't feel comfortable by the time he's done then I'll pray I feel led to pray for uh, the baptism and the Holy Spirit for the churches throughout Texas and for boldness to rise up in the in the pastor, so I'm going to pray for that. Iduramni kusuram nengala karam nanga. Father, I pray that you would baptize Texas in the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, Lord. We speak revival, awakening, and I pray for the pastors, Lord, that they would teach and preach the Word of God with boldness, that you would put steel in their spines to stand up for righteousness and boldness, Lord, and let the roar of the Lion of Judah go throughout the land in Jesus name Lord God cause it to go into your government as well in Texas Lord cause there to be a great uprising in the government and in the people and in your church Lord empowered by the spirit of the living God to bring down the wickedness Lord I bleed the blood of Jesus over the borders in Jesus name 
Thank you, Lord. Let's come against that principality. Let's come against that principality. Yeah, just fine. Okay. All right. Pray again. <laughs> he wants me to he wants me to pray in harmony with him. So go ahead and pray in the spirit. That is ruling over Texas at this time. I bind you. Don't quit praying, please. Pray. I bind you. I render your vengeance null and void. We say in the name of Jesus Christ, conservative values will stand. And the hand of God shall come upon Texas and lead it to a place of security. We come against this deception that they are trying to breed over Texas. We bind you. We say you will not prosper. Thank you, God. We speak light over Texas. Light. 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 Truth. Truth. Who? We say in the name of Jesus, Amarandos. you shall remain Chumne. conservative. Yes. Jesus' name. Makata. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My daughter, my daughter had, had a dream or a vision about um, Trump losing, I don't know which election, whether it was the one that Biden won or whether it was his coming election, but the reason was because Texas flipped. So we don't want that to happen. So this week, I'm going to pray and make sure that we did everything tonight we needed to do. And if we haven't, we'll do some more next week. But pray for Texas that it does not flip. Because if Texas not flipping is going to carry us over the line, <laughs> we need it, right? Okay. Now, don't talk politics in the church. <laughs> this is what you call, we're talking spiritual warfare, sister. Spiritual warfare. <laughs> yeah, I sure love you guys. <laughs> I love you lots. Now, is anyone needing prayer? We've got some people that I'll ask them to come to you and lay hands on you if you do. You guys are all well this week. That's wonderful. I just need to keep talking to you about how wonderful God is, and you're going to get so well. I'll have to get better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am healed. Okay, we'll see you next Sunday. We love you. And those who have joined us online, we love you so much. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you, Daryl. You did great. Ha, ha, ha.